Hello, welcome to Simple Flying in our Future Flying series. We are here with Archer Aviation founder and CEO, Adam Goldstein. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So can you talk us through a little bit your midnight uh, EV toll and your vision for it? Yeah, so we are building a vehicle that is really designed to replace 60 to 90 minute drives, uh, trips that are typically taken, you know, on the ground, um, but are, you know, relatively short distances. So call it less than a hundred miles and replace those with trips in the air that are five to 10 minutes. And so we built a vehicle that takes off and lands um, vertically uh, like a helicopter, but then also flies forward on a wing, like an airplane. Um, the vehicle is piloted and can carry up to four passengers um, and flies uh, up to 150 miles per hour. You've actually just announced you've completed your phase one testing. So what was the process for that? And what did you have to prove uh, to the FAA in that? So as we take a, a new aircraft and really um, introduce it into the flight test program, we want to make sure that we follow a very rigorous but very safe process. And so we start with really simple maneuvers um, in different um, uh, forms of hovering, um, and then we start to move the vehicle around and ultimately start to fly faster and faster as we expand the flight envelope. Um, so we have been through many years of testing now, um, and this is a, a vehicle that has gone through uh, an incredible amount of work, uh, and we feel very great about the performance and safety characteristics of the vehicle. And so we have now uh, really started to enter the envelope expansion uh, part of the phase where we're moving out of the, the hover portion and, um, you know, the exciting parts where we can start to, you know, fly higher and faster, where we can get, uh, you know, some amazing shots. Any significant changes from your initial concept to the design that you have now that you're testing? The initial concept that we had started flight testing um, with our vehicle, which we called Maker, had a uh, similar configuration. It was a 12 tilt six configuration vehicle. Um, that vehicle weighed roughly around 4,000 pounds um, and had similar aero models, flight controls, tilt propeller systems. So a lot of similarities to the vehicles. The kind of some of the, the biggest lessons that we learned uh, through that vehicle was understanding the ultimate performance that we wanted in order to build an economically viable business. And so what we recognized was in order to be able to carry a pilot plus four passengers, we would have to build a substantially larger vehicle. And I think the other um, you know, companies in the industry have started to catch on and have been building larger vehicles as well. Um, so the Midnight vehicle is a 6,500 uh, pound maximum takeoff weight vehicle and um, is uh, is designed to meet all the needs of an urban air mobility um, you know type of mission and um, to date has been I think uh, one of the one of the best lookings and best performing planes uh, on the market. You won a design award recently, didn't you? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so we did recently win a, a design award and. I, I think one of the reasons why we've been recognized from the design perspective is that we intentionally built a plane that was emotional instead of building a vehicle that was just purely mathematical. So when you build airplanes, they are very um, challenging to have design freedoms because anything you do to make the plane looks cool, to look cool, pretty much will hurt you from a performance perspective. The aerodynamics just you know, get worse. Planes look the way they do for a reason. If you look at a Boeing and an Airbus plane, they largely all look the same. So when we started to design this plane, we really did want people to have an emotional connection to the vehicle, much like they do with their cars. And so we did uh, spend a lot of time and a lot of engineering effort to get the vehicle to, to looking that way. And it was a challenge, but ultimately was very rewarding in the end. And I think we built an amazing vehicle that looks beautiful, that when people see it, they just want to touch it. They want to get into it. And that was you know, really critical to the mission, especially as we think about the go-to-market approach. So this is a vehicle that has the potential to transform the way the world moves. It has an ability to create a new form of mass transportation. So we wanted to make sure we built a vehicle that people wanted to fly in, that wasn't scary, but that was actually like really attractive that they could really feel the emotional connection with the vehicle itself. Awesome. What do you think was the biggest challenge for designing Midnight to where it is today? I think building these new electric um, you know, aircraft is extremely challenging across pretty much every possible front. It's not a helicopter. It's not, you know, a fixed wing, you know, aircraft. Uh, it's big and it's electric. And so they're different. Um, but one of the things that we did to really combat that was to build a vehicle 
that had a very intentional strategy, which was a vehicle that was designed around certification and manufacturing from day one. And so that was a pretty big differentiator. Much of the industry has been focused on R&D. And when, when the reason it's been focused on R&D is you've needed a lot of R&D over the years to actually build a vehicle that can you know get any type of performance, speed range and payload. And so when we focused on building a vehicle that was built around certification and manufacturing from the beginning, it introduced a whole another level of challenges because you can't just build something for, you know, that's cool to show people. You have to build something that can actually get through the regulatory process, which is which is super, super challenging. So what we decided to do was to partner with the tier one suppliers on the majority of the subsystems. Um, pretty much all the systems outside of the powertrain. So we work with Honeywell on the um, on the actuators and Garmin on the flight deck um, and Saffron on the flight control computer as, as, as several examples. But we did decide to build the powertrain ourselves. And the reason we did that was it was very challenging, if not impossible, to find um, a, a supplier that could build a powertrain that met the needs that we had. And so we had to mix... Um, you know, this strategy and relying on, you know, really high quality, you know, companies that have built amazing products with architectures that have been certified over many generations of vehicles, mix that strategy with also then going out and building some of our own components, because we simply didn't have a choice to go out there and buy a powertrain off the shelf. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so what do you think are going to be roadblocks to getting on the path of certification? I know it's a new process. Obviously, the FAA is still developing how they're going to certify uh, all of these aircraft, what do you think is going to be your biggest challenges? I think certifying a new vehicle in general is just extremely difficult. And you can see it over the you know past generations of you know vehicle new vehicles being certified. But what's different and unique about you know our industry is there is uh, there are safety characteristics about these vehicles that make them, inherently safer than vehicles that have already been certified today. So there are helicopters out there today. So the pitch to the FAA is, hey, we have this vehicle that not only has these amazing characteristics, like, you know, it's sustainable, um, you know, and, and other features like that, but it has safety characteristics that are superior than the existing aircraft that they've already certified. So the vehicles are designed to have zero single points of failure. So fully redundant vehicles that are similar to what you'll see in the large commercial airliners today. So that's really been helpful. The second thing that's been helpful is it's been very important um, to uh, you know really the entire US that the, the, the US maintains a leadership position in aviation. And so if there is a Tesla-like moment in the sky that there needs to be a US company or several US companies that can participate in that. And so we've seen a lot of you know, active um, you know, participation from the regulators, um, from the um, you know, kind of the political system that has been you know, backing the industry to really help make sure that you know, America can maintain this leadership position. And so that's been you know, a, a huge help in getting us to where we are today. And now we're in the fortunate part where it's just up to us to go out and actually execute against the plans that have been put out there. And so we are in the, you know, moving into the testing phase where we're starting to, you know, test the vehicles um, and kind of prove that we can meet the safety standards that have been laid out. Awesome. And you're actually, we're talking about initially uh, going into service next year. Is that a still a timeline that you feel is feasible? Or at least yeah. getting flying in the air? Yeah, so our goal has always been to build, to get to a point where we can freeze the design, build the conforming aircrafts, and then start to take them through the certification process. Now, of course, we don't control the, um, you know, the, the regulators, the FAA, they will all control the ultimate timeline, but it's our goal to be ready um, to be certified as soon as the FAA is ready. And so we will, we are building now uh, conforming aircraft, which really unlocks the portion of the um, certification program where we can start getting credit now for uh, you know for a lot of the work that we've done against um, the certification plans that have been laid out, which um, is very encouraging in terms of um, being able to meet uh, you know uh, a, a fairly quick timeline. Do you have the three aircraft so that you can test multiple things concurrently? Is that why you're building three? Yeah, we're actually building six, but we have three that are under construction now. Um, the first one is about to enter uh, the final assembly phase. And so we are going through this process of um, building multiple aircraft so we can test uh, many different systems and different things at the same time. Um, so we want to make sure that we can build a flight test program that is, um, you know, um, that's very safe, but also enables us to move through the process, um, you know, as quickly as possible. Awesome. And I know you've inked some incredible partnerships. 
with airlines and different companies. What do you see as the the role for your aircraft going first out the gate? So the aircraft, you know, perform, you know, some some very interesting missions. And we get asked all the time, you know, is it going to be geared towards people or is it going to be geared towards cargo? And is it going to be geared towards there's so many different use cases. I think moving people around is probably the biggest um, you know, market that's that's the most interesting to us. I think cargo is, is still very interesting, but I think we are going to focus on moving people around. The early go-to-market routes that we've been targeting are what we call um, our trunk routes or airport to city centers, where there's already people that are traveling these routes every day, suffering, uh, you know, in traffic. These are routes where people, you know, think about like a Manhattan to a JFK or a Manhattan to a Newark Liberty International, you know, roughly 20 mile type of trip that will take you 90 minutes or so in a car. There is known demand and customer willingness to pay. You can see that because these routes are taken every day with rideshare. And so there's a lot of data that shows that people take these trips and they they want, um, I think, better experiences. So instead of paying, let's say, $100 to go from Manhattan to Newark, if you could pay $100 but fly there and get there in five minutes, and even in the best case scenario, land behind security or have a private screening so you're not in the main kind of corridor through the TSA process, that would be an incredible, um, I think, value proposition. And so the airport to city center route is a really interesting one to start at and then to branch out from there um, into the city. So Manhattan and New York is a great city for us to target. Same thing as we're looking at some of the other big cities like LA and San Francisco um, and Miami. Awesome. Those actually all sound like great, uh, great places to, to get that in. Um, what regions after the US are you expecting to, to see demand for your aircraft in? Well, I think the aircraft will have demand globally. And so we really have tried to, you know, partner with some leading companies and some leading countries that have, you know, real ambitions to help transform uh, transportation in their regions. And so um, two of the countries that we've been working with, you know, very closely are one is India and where we've partnered with um, uh, Rahul Bhatia in, uh, in Indigo, um, the largest airline in India. Um, they have been, you know, very interested in trying to solve some of their large infrastructure problems where you have an incredible amount of traffic, a lot of congestion um, and limited, um, you know, infrastructure to help solve those problems. Um, so I think India is going to be one of the most interesting markets in the world. Um, and then the other area that we've talked a lot about is the UAE. Um, so the UAE is a really interesting um, country that has focused on being, you know, leading in terms of transportation and technology and has put um, a lot of effort into um, really trying to help stand up, um, you know, some of the early days, the sort of the early markets for, um, you know, for us to be able to operate into. Awesome. And what's coming up next for you in 2024 that you're looking forward to? So 2024 for us is all about building conforming aircraft, um, flying the, you know, the piloted planes and really showing people that, you know, these aircraft are very advanced and the designs are very mature and that we are, uh, you know, starting to, you know, get into the late phases here of, um, you know, of the, you know, of, of the vehicles being able to enter into market and the, you know, design maturity and the, in the certification regulatory process. So for us, it's all about uh, building those aircraft and flying uh, those uh, piloted conforming aircraft, um, as well as standing up manufacturing. So we have partnered with Stellantis, which is uh, one of the largest automakers in the world. They uh, uh, make, you know, cars such as Jeep, Ram, Maserati, and they have been helping us stand up the manufacturing facility that we have uh, in Georgia, which is uh, in a town called Covington, right outside of Atlanta, um, as well as our um, facility um, here in the Bay Area. And what is your target manufacturing rate once you get everything up and running that would be ideal for you? A lot of that is going to be dependent on ultimately on, on where the demand is. So what's interesting is if you look at the helicopter market, there are around 50,000 helicopters globally. Um, now that's not a lot. And when you look outside the window, you don't see one, right? That's not like there's helicopters flying all over the place. So typically helicopters are reserved for, you know, the very fortunate, very few wealthy um, individuals. Um, and the reason that people take helicopters is it's very convenient to fly over traffic, to get where you want very quickly, um, avoid traffic. And so now imagine you have a helicopter that is not only accessible to the masses because it's much more affordable, uh, but it's also very, very safe and very, very quiet. So you can scale them. So the question is how many of these vehicles can be built and how will the world accept these vehicles and how long will it take 
for the world to adopt this technology. So what we want to do is be able to build hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vehicles over time. Um, now we will start in a, you know, obviously uh, in a much more um, measured pace as we're building vehicles. And so the um, manufacturing facility in Georgia has been designed up to, to build up within two phases. The first phase can build up to um, around six, 700 vehicles. And the second phase can build up to around 2000 vehicles on an annual basis. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any other exciting news or advice that you want to share for us? Yeah, I think you're starting to see the industry really get traction in the mainstream. And that's what's really exciting because it's we have this amazing community um, amongst the aviation industry, and then even you know the smaller community and the you know EV tall, urban air mobility, advanced air mobility community. But it's really starting to break out, I think, into the mainstream, and that's what's becoming like really exciting. And you've seen you know some of the biggest uh, you know companies partner uh, you know with with companies in our industry, and you're starting to see, you know, more mainstream, uh, you know, participation. And so I think you'll start to see that more in 2024. Um, so be on the lookout for that as you see Archer, uh, you know, start to become uh, more of a more of a headline in the mainstream as, as opposed to, you know, within our system, within our small community. Awesome. So my final question is, this is obviously a very crowded market. Lots of people have the same idea and they know it's a great way to Attract customers and also business. What would set Archer apart from your other competitors out there who I don't need to name? Yeah. So the really the, the strategy that Archer took, I think, was pretty different than a lot of the other companies. And so our whole strategy has been to build a vehicle around this very specific like business case which are these less than 100 mile trips that we can replace these trips on the ground uh, with trips in the air. And then to leverage the tier one aerospace supply uh, to reduce uh, certification risk as we go through this. And that strategy has really allowed us to move at a pace that no one else in the industry has moved. Um, that also has allowed us to recruit the best engineers in the world, which further reinforces that strategy, which then further led to our ability to raise a substantial amount of capital. And so, you mix that with what I think is a, a beautiful design, uh, a product that people want, and all of a sudden you have this incredibly powerful formula that has just allowed us to take a leadership position in the industry, uh, something we certainly do not take for granted. We work hard every single day, all day, all night, uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, uh, you know, to protect. And so, you know, it really is my goal to build, you know, the world that I want to live in, um, which is this future world where products like Midnight are out there um, moving people on an everyday basis. And um, that's the kind of thing that that really inspires me on an everyday basis that I think inspires the whole company that's just enabled us to uh, to be in the fortunate position that we're in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. And we can't wait to see what you guys have coming up this year. Awesome. Thanks for having me. In addition to our daily YouTube videos, Simple Flying publishes over 150 articles every week. If you're looking for the latest aviation news and insights, visit simpleflying.com.